Hey everybody, uh, welcome to The Birder Show. This is our first time doing this kind of format, this sort of live interview Zoom conversation, but we had the opportunity to talk to a friend of the show, Jennifer Ackerman, author of The Genius of Birds and the Bird Way, about her new book, What an Owl Knows, uh, The New Science of the World's Most Enigmatic Birds. And yeah, we couldn't turn down the opportunity to have Jennifer back into the kind of live virtual Birder Show studio to talk more about this fantastic book. Jennifer, welcome to The Birder Show. Thank you, what a delight to be here. Jennifer, uh, thank you for being with us. I uh, really appreciate it. And um, the book, fantastic. I received my copy uh, just a few days ago and I've managed to read it over the weekend uh, and flew through it as always with your books. The writing is super engaging, really interesting and the subject matter is of course fascinating. Um, I wanted to start off just by asking you why owls? Uh, um, yeah, well, you know, I love birds, all birds, but there's just something really unique about owls. They're I mean, for one thing, they're, they're these night creatures. They have these weird uh, hoots and cries. You know, they don't have bird song per se, but they have really interesting communication. Um, and I think one of my um, first encounters, close encounters with an owl was um, many, many years ago. I, I, when my children were little, I put up a, um, an owl box on the sil old silver maple tree behind my house. Uh, just yards from the kind of bay window in our kitchen so we get a really good view and one spring an eastern screech owl took up residence in the box and it would roost in the day with you know it's just this little weird enigmatic face showing in the hole and then at night it would vanish you know head out on its hunt and I never saw it come and go but you know some nights I'd hear it's like eerie shrieking and uh, and then in the morning, this bird gave my two girls their first lesson in top of the line predators because, you know, hanging out of this round hole in the box would be the wing like of a robin or the tail of a blue jay. Or one time it was the whole body of a morning dove. And, um, you know, then the, then the, the prey would sort of like jerk, jerk, you know, and, and until it was pulled into the box and uh, vanished into the hole. So when I took down the box, you know, it was just packed with feathers and furry remains of mice. And the birds are just extraordinary. So, you know, I started to think about like writing about a family of birds. And I thought, well, you know, owls would be so interesting. There's so much diversity. And they really made my head kind of just spin with questions, you know, like what makes an owl an owl? And how do they get to be the way they are? They're just so different from other birds, you know? Why are they active at night? Um, it, it, it was um, really, uh, I wanted to explore a whole set of questions about these birds uh, and find out what we really know about them. And it turns out we, we know quite a lot. Um, we, you know, we've been studying these birds for a long time, but it's really only recently that we've had some of the technological breakthroughs that really have allowed us to solve some of the mysteries that have been around for centuries. So it turned out to be a good time to write the book. I was going to say, that's kind of one of the fascinating uh, aspects of the book you talk about it a little bit in the introduction is that owls are kind of simultaneously one of the most widely recognized widely kind of recognizable types of bird or even animal on earth right you say mm -hmm. the a small child can sort of draw the outline of an owl or recognize the outline of an owl yet at the same mm -hmm. time we know so little about them because of what you said the largely nocturnal habits and the lack of technology that's enabled us to kind of keep track of these birds i mean we could dive in and talk about so many different aspects of this book but i mean just to start us off for example one thing that really fascinated me in some of the latter chapters was talking about migration um mm -hmm. among owls because it's mm -hmm. something that we traditionally think of owls as being quite static right they perch in that tree you know outside your yard they hoot at night that's where they are that's where the owl is but actually a lot of species are migratory and we're only just beginning to understand those migrations. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So one of the research um, projects that I, I sort of dove into and, and went out um, banding the migrating nor northern sawwhat owls um, in not far from where I live in Virginia and um, learned that these owls are migrating in really big numbers. And, you know, who knew? And, and as you said, the truth is, you know, we thought owls were pretty much sedentary, that they didn't move around like other birds did, you know, migratory birds, they remained more or less in the same place all their lives. And that is true for some species like um, little owls and uh, barred owls, northern spotted owls, but other species do migrate. And, um, you know, they, they move around for some of the same reasons that other migratory birds do. They're, they're uh, looking for food and, and good um, breeding grounds. 
But, you know, when it comes to the details, owls are really hard to pigeonhole. They just don't follow the, the kind of the same patterns that, that other migratory birds do. Um, and I think it's really been with the help of this, you know, banding, uh, radio tagging, satellite telemetry. Uh, we're learning how some of these species migrate in just very unusual ways. Like I think about the, the snowy owl that migrates north sometimes in the winter. And, you know, why would an owl do that? Like migrating into the, <laughs> the depths of a dark Arctic winter, you know? And it turns out that they're, you know, they're learning how to hunt. They've learned how to hunt seabirds over the Arctic ice. So it's um, it's really fascinating, I think, that what we've learned about the movements of birds from some of this new technology and also the dedication of a lot of people working on these at these banding stations and, and tracking these birds. I was, I was going to say, I was going to mention the work of all the people working with migratory birds, you know, the Motus Towers and all the radio tracking. That's amazing how, you know, snowy owls that you just mentioned have attracted our attention. You know, everyone has been attracted by the magicness of a snowy mm -hmm. owl. They are, they are reaching southern and southern. You know, we, we always joke here that eventually we're going to have our first snowy owls, you know, like reaching <laughs> Florida and then Colombia in 10 years with the, you know, yeah. eruptions. Uh, about, you know, this is snowy owls. You, you, you have any particular, I mean, you research a lot. To do you know to do your book and you've talked mm -hmm. to a lot of people and I, I found them fascinating you know my my experience with my life as Noel was amazing was was super cool and the moment I saw it I was absolutely captivated by this animal which are two or three of the most amazing crazy stories you heard from people like engaging emotionally with the Noel owls during all this research like people really really you know close to them uh, absolutely I mean you know I will say. Uh, it's really true for most owl encounters for people. If they have like, uh, you know, an encounter with a um, great gray owl or, um, you know, or, or a snowy or, you know, e even something as common as a barred owl up here, it's it's an extraordinary experience. And, you know, I, I remember um, the first time I got really close to an owl was in um, uh, in Montana and I was helping with the banding of uh, long-eared owls and you know just being that close to a these really magnificent um and so and elusive birds i think is is extraordinary for people and you know people like denver holt who study the snowy owl you know they have a, a gazillion stories of um you know just <laughs> sometimes rough encounters with these birds you know he he um oftentimes uh removes chicks from the nest to band them and snowy owls are really fierce nest protectors so they'll come in and they'll, they'll really dive bomb him from behind and and it's painful um so so there there's that kind of encounter and and uh then the a guy jim duncan who studies great gray owls in in uh, canada you know he's fascinated with them um and and has gotten very um familiar with their their habits but one thing that 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 he just couldn't wrap his head around was that these birds thrive in the really dense deep snow and the you know very cold winters that they have up there and and uh, he you know he ended up studying well how does a, a great gray owl um, how is it able to hunt uh, when the it critters it's hunting are under deep snow? And that was a really fascinating story of, of scientific discovery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that whole section in the book about the the kind of auditory capacity of owls, you know, you're talking about great gray owls being able to, to you know, zoom in, well, zoom in, like zero in on and find, mm -hmm. locate voles, you know, sort of a foot down under thick blankets of snow. I mean, that whole section is... It's kind of incredible. I mean, basically, these owls inside their brains, inside their, you know, their nervous systems, all this contain technology in a sense that that even us as humans haven't really been able to master in many ways. I mean, I'm not sure there's many things that we possess that could locate an owl, uh, sorry, a vole sort of two feet under deep snow. I mean, was there anything particular that you learned about owls during the course? I'm sure there were many things, but is there anything that stands out that really surprised you during the research for this book? Well, I mean, they, their hearing did, you know, when I talk to the scientists who study their auditory systems, they call them the, the, the owl's auditory system, the Ferraris of sound sensitivity. I mean, they're just 
unmatched in the animal world. They're so extraordinary. So that was one one thing, and how much we've learned about it, um, and you know how how they can um, triangulate, and you know because some in some species one ear is higher than the other, and so they can actually pinpoint their prey in uh, three dimensional space. But one of the things that really surprised me that I just didn't expect was the complexity of their um, vocalizations and the, the kind of the ways in which they communicate with um, with calls and hoots that are actually teeming with mean, meaning. You know, we thought a kind of a hoot was a hoot was a hoot. Well, it's not true. Um, there are all different kinds of hoots and territorial hoots and emphatic hoots. And and then owls don't just hoot, they also squawk and squeal. And, um, and there are very specific meanings associated with these sounds. And that was stunning to me, along with the fact that they have um, very individual voices. And so their, their vocalizations are highly individual. They're um, scientists can actually fingerprint individual birds using the sounds of their their uh, territorial hoots. And this is very useful for a couple of reasons. It's a great way to um, uh, monitor the birds and, and keep track of their populations. If you know one individual differs from another, then you can count two individuals rather than one. And also it gives them a window, gives scientists a window on the, the social lives of, of owls, which was very surprising to me too. I'd always thought owls were, you know, monogamous. They stayed together for life. But when the scientists have, you know, learned how to tease apart these individual voices, they got a window on the love lives of, of owls. And, and, and they are, there's all kinds of mate switching going on and hanky panky that we, we had no idea about before, <laughs> before we mastered this. <laughs> Well, speaking of, you know, large numbers of owls, I think we were talking about, um, we, we talked about this a little bit uh, at the beginning of this conversation, um, but the, I think it's Serbia, right? It's Serbia where these these huge numbers of, of long-eared owls congregate. Um, I know that David Lindo, who's been a guest on our show in the past, new features in in your book is kind of uh, one of the, the people who sort of started taking tours there. He does these kind of owl tours, I think, every year, and they roost in mind-blowing numbers I mean like you said we always think of owls as being basically solitary pairing right. up maybe maybe tiny groups but what kind of numbers are we talking about of these long-eared owls in these, in these rooms? hundreds hundreds colonies of hundreds uh roosting together and you know you look at some of the the photographs of the trees and they're just <laughs> like owls are like ornaments I mean they're just everywhere and it's such a unique kind of um uh, situation there. There are other places where these long-eared owls will roost together in groups of, you know, 10, 12, 14. But these villages in Serbia are special because these owls are roosting in really large numbers. And um, and it's it's fascinating that there, there's some something going on there. These birds are information sharing, you know, they're about hunting locations and also about what's safe and what's not safe in the context of their so they're they're in villages and the reason that they're there is um is partly because the agricultural areas around them have been um you know developed and are are now farmed and they um they go to the cities the villages in part to for safety and also uh to keep warm in the winter um, and it's a it's really a, a a remarkable phenomenon. I mean, just seeing a few owls cozied up together, it just defi <laughs> defies all of the expectations. Yeah. Sure once, once once talking, I don't know if it was with you, Chris, but we were in Costa Rica traveling with David Lindo, and we were talking about all this craziness about birds, you know, all these crazy superlatives that birds are. And we were wondering on these numbers of owls in Serbia, if it's a little bit driven by us, you know, humans, settlements, agriculture, that these owls are changing so much their behavior, you know, and eventually in a couple thousand years, there might be some evolutionary little signs there. Also, you know, it's different to have 10 birds roosting together for a week, for a month, than having hundreds of birds also competing and, you know, like mm -hmm. looking for space, looking for prey, even, if it's a lot. So it's pretty interesting. I hope that anyone actually, do you know if anyone is properly studying the thing in Serbia? Like, you know, yeah, well, them, marking them. 
what what you say is is very true and Milan Ruzic who's who's a Serbian ornithologist is very interested oh. in this question and he thinks that that is exactly that we we are influencing these birds and that they are um it, it, they are evolving new adaptations because of this behavior and actually um there's really fascinating research going on in in um South America with burrowing owls in this regard because they started colonizing cities, um, suburbs, just a few decades ago. And there's a study that shows that they've already evolved variants in, I think it's close to 100 brain genes that are likely important in adapting to city environments. And they're genes that are like influencing, oh, levels of attention and, um, and also what's called behavioral flexibility, which is that capacity to respond to new challenges in new ways. And, you know, in a way that that points to something very hopeful that, you know, that owls have within them this variation and this adaptability that's going to allow them to uh, respond flexibly to some of these really uh, severe environmental challenges that uh, that we're throwing at them with with habitat loss and climate change. It's interesting you were talking about burrowing owls because um... One of the things that there's there's a whole section on it in the book we were talking about um, Diego and I've spoken about this. The the burrowing owl is currently considered one species, right? This is a species mm -hmm. that ranges from quite far north in in North America all the way down fairly far south across the across the Americas. Right. Um, but even within Colombia, there are at least a couple, if not I think maybe even more Diego, right? Distinct subspecies. There's there's one population in the coffee region, one up in the Guajira. Populations, yeah, they never get together. At least, yeah, exactly east of the Andes. And there's a whole section in your book about people studying the possibility that the burrowing owl is actually several, at least two, if not more distinct species. Um, right. I don't know, uh, uh, regarding that, um, what, what's the uh, what's the kind of outlook on that study? Do we know any more about that? Well, it's really an interesting, I mean, if you think about it, these birds are in 24 countries in North and South America. I mean, they range all the way from, you know, the Pacific Northwest of North America, all the way down to the, you know, southernmost regions of Brazil. And, and so, you know, what what is the are these really subspecies or are they different enough that they're they're actually separate species? And that's one of the questions that um, David Johnson, who's the director of the Global Owl Project, is tackling right now. He's he's looking, he's gathering um, data on all the different uh, subspecies of of burrowing owls, um, and and he's collecting measurements and uh, blood samples for DNA. And also uh, their vocalizations, because there you can actually have distinctions between species that are based on their uh, their vocalization. It's a way to differentiate species is by their calls. So he's hard at work at this. Um, I think the the uh, the data is not yet complete by any stretch, but the study is really fascinating and and also very challenging. These birds are. Are um, I mean he, he has a strategy for for trapping them, and it was based on using a um, a call that he had recorded in at a research site in in Oregon, and he was using that recording to you know you put it inside the mouth of a trap in Maringá, Brazil, where I was working with him, and. Um, but the males weren't, weren't, you know, these are very territorial birds about their, their burrows. They don't like intruders, but these birds were like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> doesn't sound like a burrowing owl to me. And they wouldn't go into the trap um, to explore what the intruder might be doing the way they were in, in Oregon. So he figured out that he had to record a, um, a Brazilian burrowing owl um, and put that recording inside the trap in order to lure a uh, territorial male into the trap and and catch him. So it was very challenging. And you know, this is happening in, as I said, in in all twenty four countries uh, where these birds uh, exist. It's really fascinating stuff. I mean, like I said, one of the things we should say for the people watching who are maybe just joining us uh, on Facebook, particularly that the, what we're discussing here is is the book uh, What an Owl Knows, Jennifer's new book, which comes out June thirteenth. I believe, right? June 13th, yes. uh, the new science of the world's most enigmatic birds. Um, the thing I love so much about reading the book is that like a lot of your, you know, your previous books, The Genius of Birds and the Birdway, is that every page elicited some response for me, some gasp of, wow, that can't, that's incredible, that's amazing, what an amazing piece of information. There's a, there's a 
it's jam packed full of fascinating little nuggets and bits of information. Mm -hmm. One that really stood out to me, and it's it's a, just half a paragraph in one page of the book that I found fascinating was, I think it's Eastern screech owls bringing live blind snakes into their nesting holes, feeding some of them to the young, but leaving some of them alive where they kind of almost act as, I guess like a, it's like a composting system. It's like they're composting in their own nest. They're, they're bringing something right. in that eats all of the remains that the baby chicks leave right. so that they don't have to clean out the nest. It's, it's kind of remarkable, these, these adaptations. Uh, is there any yeah. other sort of behaviors like that that, that jumped out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's um, uh, the burrowing owl again. Uh, the, the male brings in the food for um, females and young, and he brings mostly insects. And he, he cripples the insects and then leaves them at the mouth of the burrow. He doesn't kill them. So they remain fresh, but they can't run away. And um, how do they know to do that? That is just to me, <laughs> such a remarkable adaptation. And the um, elf owls and flammulated owls, they actually feed their young um, scorpions, but they remove the venomous stingers before they feed um, these, these uh, scorpions to their young. So there's some things like that, that, you know, you just marvel at, um, you know, where, how this, how this happened, where it came from. Diego, um, I'm interested from your perspective, just sort of birding in Colombia or anywhere around the world, really. Um, I'm guessing you've had a fair few encounters with owls over the years. Is there any particular owl encounter that, that you mentioned your snowy owl, but any any other owl encounter that stands out? Yeah, there, there are a few that are remarkable and, and I kind of want to, you know, take advantage to ask one of the one of the questions and one of the chapters that I found in the book really fascinating is fascinating is how quiet are you know owls flying and and mm -hmm. they're not totally mute as you know explain us in the book but you know they they produce so low noises and one of my most beautiful encounters is with an owl that i haven't actually seen yet is a buff fronted owl and i was with a with a group in southeastern brazil with eduardo patrial my my friend co-leading we tried to see this owl for probably one hour and it changed positions several times and we didn't notice a single little no noise at all and that always amazes me and I, actually we as a guide as guides i don't know if you do it chris while owling too when i'm when i, I go out and i try to have a little background light even the moon or the city behind mm -hmm. the, the trees so i can see the shape of the owl flying because otherwise you have no idea when the bird came until it calls so what's what's this about the strategies and the mechanicals and all the crazy adaptations, you know, the crazy machinery the owls have to be to be silent lives. They are bulky and chubby. Yeah, I, I think it is one of the really the great wonders of the bird world is this is this owl's quiet flight, you know, and we're we're still just beginning to tease apart all the details. Um, you know, some things have been known for a long time, like, you know, they they owls fly quietly in part because they have low wing loading, you know, their wings are big in relation to their bodies. So they have this sort of um buoyant, slow flight. But it's really the ingenious design of their wings and their feathers that um, that are you know these remarkable and squelching sound and and I think it's a, you know birds make noise when they fly for two main reasons you know the air flowing over the wing surface that produces turbulence air eddies that make noise and second their feathers make a lot of noise when they rub together so they sort of rustle and whoosh and and rasp against each other. Now, owl wings, they have these features that really hush their flight. They have a at the, the leading edge of the wing where the wing meets the oncoming air. They have a row of little fine hair-like bristles. And when airflow hits those bristles, it the serrations, they break up the turbulence. So it, they effectively suppress any swooshing sound. Um, there's also a like a trailing edge of, of um uh, wispy kind of vein-like feathers that serve a similar function. And then there's this soft layer of plush fibers called penula that they're like velvet that mm -hmm. just co coat the feathers in the whole wing. And they silence any rubbing together noise that the, that the feathers might make. So it's these, this combination of these, of these three things along with the wing loading, uh, low wing loading that, that uh, makes also 
really brilliantly quiet. Um, so much so that you know engineers now and and designers are are modeling noise reducing structures in in all kinds of of um, mechanical things like wind turbine blades and and uh, even Japan's bullet trains. You know they have they're designing things using biomimicry, um, imitating the these uh, these design features on an owl's wing. One one yeah. one recommendation is anytime anyone has an option of, you know, grabbing an owl in a research station, going steam banding, or even a feather, a primary or secondary feather in the ground, check for those special barbs and, you know, little structures. An owl, an owl feather is like another world. Yes. I'm guessing, Jennifer, that during the course of researching this book, you had, well, I, I don't need to guess, it's a lot of it's detailed in the book itself, but you must have had a lot of close encounters with owls, I know there's there's plenty who are named, you know, by their given name by the person who's, you know, working <laughs> with them or researching them or something like that. Um, yeah. Is there any particular? Um, well, I, I, it's a two part. Was, was question, there a Chris? So. Was there a Diego? <laughs> yeah, we should have owls. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a good point. Um, I, I, it, it's kind of a two part question. I, I first of all, was there any particular? Uh, sort of research owl, captive owl, owl that's being studied that you have particularly fond memories of? And second of all, uh, any particular live wild encounter with an owl that, that stands out in your in your memory? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm going to start with this, the second one because mm -hmm. it was so, uh, it was so surprising, unexpected. Um, I saw a, a spectacled owl in Cali, Colombia, uh, in a high up in a tree behind a park, an apartment building. Um, and we were standing in the parking lot and, and, and I'd never seen a spectacle owl before. So, you know, maybe it's a common thing there, but for me, it was absolutely incredible. I just couldn't believe my eyes. And, uh, you know, there it was. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the one experience that I had that is, ha has just, remained so powerful for me was when I actually got to hold a, um, a long-eared owl that uh, the Denver Holt was banding and measuring and, and studying. Um, and this, this bird, um, it was, I had, I had its, you know, its sharp razor talons tucked between my fingers um, holding it. And, you know, those are killer talons. They're just, they're designed to kill. And then the, the, the feathers of this bird were so soft. It was like rabbit's fur. And there was this moment when, you know, the, the two of us sort of, I was holding it and um, while well, they did some measurements and things. And, and this bird sort of looked at me and we locked eyes with this kind of cat-like stare at each other. And, um, you know, just like, creature to creature, you know, what are you? And I, be, I just began to think, you know, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Um, it was, it was um, really a powerful experience. And, and, um, and then, you know, I, I got to, um, I got to release the bird. And when I opened my hand, it just flew off without a sound. And I, I thought, you know, it's just, this is a miraculous creature. And um, it was so amazing to be up close and personal with a bird like that. It was just, I just outstanding for me. And you know, the people who do this research, they they experience this all the time, but it's still, it feels they've told me miraculous each time it happens. And you know, I think about some of the the citizen scientists in particular who are working with these birds. There's a, a woman who does, um, she's an, she runs an um, emergency room uh, in a major hospital. All day long, she deals with trauma. And at night, she goes out and she captures northern sawwood owls in mist nets and she bans them. And it's this you know, I, I said, how can you do this? You know, some nights she, she, she never goes to bed. She just bans owls all night long. And she said, it's just this healing thing after, um, you know, the being in a, in a place of so much sadness and death all day long. She says, there's something about the aliveness of an owl that really um, boosts her and makes it possible for her to go on. So um, 
you know, night after night, she does this. And, and uh, there, there is something just, I think, extraordinary about, uh, about these birds that, uh, that we humans just relate to in a, in a very powerful way. It's, it's interesting you say that because there's, there's a part of, your, of the book that's dedicated to that because, am I right in saying, I think I've got this right, that owls are the only species of bird with forward-facing front-facing eyes. Front eyes like mm -hmm. like humans. So perhaps it's, it's kind of hypothesized by people in the book that this maybe has something to do with our sort of strange connection that we have with owls, that maybe we see something of ourselves in owls. They're also delightfully expressive little creatures. We were talking before we actually started this transmission about about this little bird here, the northern sawwet owl, which I had my first encounter with the northern sawwet owl in Michigan just a couple of weeks ago up in the uh, the pine forest up there. And you see this little bird here has a very sort of sweet, soft expression, slightly curious, cute looking little teddy bear of a thing. But the one that I saw ranged from that expression to daggers, absolute daggers, look like it wanted to tear your face off and then back to relaxed and back to, and they have this incredible way of shuffling between expressions that I've never seen in any other type of bird before. I mean, we, we tend to anthropomorphize wildlife, right? You know, you see parrots cocking their heads to the side. We know from your previous books that those are extremely intelligent birds and they are thinking things and working things out. But there's something about the physical expression of an owl that maybe connects us as humans to them more than some other species. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. I think it's the the forward facing eyes and the and the the their expressiveness. Um, and you know, there the, there's a, a in fact some of the um, the the owls in Kikinda in Serbia that roost together like that, they they look, um, they're all long-eared owls, but they look so different depending on, you know, sort of what mood they're in or what what's happening around them that they look almost like different species. So, you know, if, a, if a, an owl is in distress or fearful, it's, you know, its eyes are wide open and kind of its feathers are slicked back and its facial disc is pulled taut. It just looks like a different bird from, and you know, plumicorns are raised. Looks like a different bird from one that's relaxed and, you know, its eyes are, are just partly open and its facial disc is relaxed. Its feathers are all fluffed. Totally different um, appearances of these, of these birds. So yeah, there's there's um, a a very I think a very distinct kind of facial connection, um, and you know, I think that one of the things that you know we're drawn to them for that reason. You know, sometimes they just seem really cute too. <laughs> they have these, you know, adorable looking owls, um, but they're also, you know, we know they're brutal hunters, and they're they're also they have this strange lifestyle and i and they sort of appear and disappear as as um diego was saying out of you know out of nowhere you don't hear them and things aren't supposed to appear and disappear like that you know without mm -hmm. warning and so you know they they seem to break all the rules and they that we put them in this kind of supernatural category for this reason i think so it's the whole package of what you know seems familiar but also just like super strange that um, that makes them so, um, I don't know, deeply lodged in our, in our imaginations and also, you know, in our artwork and our cultural artifacts, uh, you know, owls are everywhere, um, uh, in, in, uh, recent art and all the way back to, uh, to cave art, you know, tens of thousands of years old. Well, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you because you've kind of brought it on nicely to what I, a chapter I really wanted to talk about in a little bit mm. more detail. Because one of the things I always find really fascinating in in books such as yours that delve into maybe specific families of birds or even specific species is that kind of intersection between anthropology and ornithology, where sort of mm -hmm. our human experience collides with with nature and the world around us. And, and chapter eight of your book, Half Bird, Half Spirit: Owls and the Human Imagination, goes into that a little bit more deeply, kind of owls in artwork and. Owls are, an owl is one of the, the earliest known images that we know of humans drawing, carving of birds in the, the Chauvet, I think I'm saying that right, the Chauvet mm -hmm. caves, Chauvet mm -hmm. caves in, in France, a, a long-eared or, or possibly a short-eared owl illustrated in those, in those cave paintings is something like 30,000 years old. 36,000 years 36, old, yeah. Years Somebody old. wandered into the depths of that cage, cave, and, um, and drew this owl. And it's, it's, um, it's a very recognizable image. It's not, you know, it's it's quite remarkable. And, you know, it tens of thousands, let's see, about 15, 20,000 years ago, 
Um, they've also found the um, from the Magdalenian cultures, um, adult snowy owls with um, the remains of them, you know, that have been collected in these places with with decorative carvings on their bones and feathers and and talons, you know, that clearly these birds, it was something more than 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 food source. These these birds were considered um, some, you know, some kind of of, of spirit beings or um, so it goes this this connection with them goes way, way back. Actually, actually, actually you're talking, no, they're talking about that, you know, spiritual connection that almost magical thing you said, you know, we, we have tons of examples and, you know, it's not, it's not 10 years ago that human beings have been relating to owls, you know, it's been forever. Uh, we have beautiful, good examples. You mentioned it in art, in, you know, media, in cinema, everything, but we also have like bad examples or, I mean, not bad, but tough examples. What, what are the, what are the craziest, the, the, the superlatives of these two wonder, you know, of the, of the world of ours with, with humanity, like what's the most beautiful relationship you've ever read about, you know, mm. of, of, our, I don't know, falconry or, or witchery and what is the, the, the worst consumption and witchery in a bad way and et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it is true that attitudes toward these birds really vary tremendously across the globe. And um, David Johnson, who was the burrowing owl expert, has also studied the surveyed attitudes around the world and people have conducted interviews and it really does range tremendously. And I think one of, um, it's hard to pick one, but some of the, the most beautiful um, example of, of a, of reverence for owls, I would say, is the is the Ainu, Ainu people of northern Japan who really revere owls and consider them protectors of their villages. Um, and uh, th there are other cultures like the the Yagan of of Tierra del Fuego. They consider the the barn owl the the wise grandmother who generates life giving water to their world. Um, so there's some just really beautiful um, kinds of, of relationships like that in cultures. Now, other cultures, like um, they view owls as, as emblems of evil and they're bad omens that are linked with death. Um, so there, there's, um, in, in some places, owls are killed because they're thought to be bad luck. Um, and some places, like, uh, they're just, the, the, the attitudes are... Um, mixed so like in in india and during diwali the festival of lights uh lakshmi the goddess of wealth and prosperity she said to travel the earth on an owl visiting homes so what people do is they kill owls um and they put them on their house and in an effort to trap lakshmi there so that they'll have all you know wealth all year long and thousands of owls die this way every year um during the festival of lights so it's pretty um it's pretty dark <laughs> uh but you know it's it's um it's fascinating it, it, at the same time you know yeah very very interesting and um and there are a lot of efforts going on which i found um very helpful to, to educate people um and you know in some places like in nepal uh there's a there's a wonderful a uh, fellow named Raju Acharya, who's bringing owl festivals to these rural areas to really try to help people see owls in a different light and understand them, and you know, not not uh, load them up with superstitions, but understand some of their their natural history and why they behave the way they do. Um, uh, in Zambia, there's a um, an ornithological society that actually created a book called Owls Want Loving. And it's used as an educational tool in, in primary schools, you know, through, throughout the country. So really um, intense educational efforts to, to try to change some of the attitudes that, uh, that are destructive to owls in, in different cultures. It's interesting that you, you, you talk about that particular part of the book, because that's towards the end of the book. I was, I was really interested by that section where it was mm -hmm. talking about kind of almost trying to find explanations for some of these kind of popular beliefs around how some of these mm -hmm. maybe more damaging beliefs that associate them with death and associate them with you know the afterlife and things like that and it was mm -hmm. I mean some of the scientists who you you know you, you talk about in the book are going to astounding levels of detail to explain these kind of phenomenon but they studied uh, cemeteries graveyards in different mm -hmm. countries and realized that actually the lack of regular human presence and the the, the the preponderance of kind of tall 
trees meant that a lot of owls lived in graveyards. And so yes. consequently, when people were being buried, which happened more in, in the place surveyed at dawn and dusk, that coincided with the times when owls were most likely to be active and calling. And so it corresponded with people assuming that the owl was somehow a message from the afterlife, whether that's good or bad. The, the level of detail, even going into the point where, you know, that apparently, and I didn't know this before I read the book, but the statistically, as humans, we have a tendency to, um, when we do pass away, it often happens in those kind of crepuscular hours between about three and five o'clock in the morning. It's explained in more detail in the book as to why, which also coincides with the time when an owl is likely to land in your backyard and start hooting, which has led to a lot of these beliefs connecting owl mortality with, with owls. It's fascinating. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, you know, and especially in rural areas where a lot of people die at home, um, you know, that is often those, they call them the, you know, the hours of the wolf of three and 4 a.m. when our, you know, our, our circadian rhythms are really, you know, making it hard for um, uh, the hearts to beat. And, you know, it's, uh, there's more sudden heart events in those early morning hours. And, um, and that's, you know, in places where there aren't hospital, that's where people are likely to die. And that's when people are likely to bump into an owl that's, you know, doing nothing but sitting on the roof where it's been all night long, but, uh, yeah. but they happen to see it because, they, you know, they're up and about. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. So I'm actually talking about beliefs around owls. I was, I was looking while you guys were talking about it, this book here. I know that Jennifer, you have a copy of this book that you received while you were in Colombia. Diego, I don't know if you've actually physically seen this book yet. Um, I have a photo published on that. I think so. Yeah, you're you're thanked. I haven't seen it physically. I haven't seen it physically. Yeah, but you're thanked in the credits, so you must have done something. Um, <laughs> but there's a section in there, uh, beliefs around owls in Colombia, a survey from 2014, which is sort of really breaking down. I, you won't be able to read it, but you can sort of see this kind of chart here of people's beliefs around owls, and it's talking about perceptions. And it's, you know, things have changed a lot. Obviously, things have moved on a lot in the last maybe, you know, 50, 100 years or whatever. But still, a surprising number of people, you know, sort of over 20% of people surveyed have an image of them as damaging, bad luck, you know, a bad. 15% of people say that they know someone who's killed an owl. And I do sometimes wonder if there's maybe a, a little bit of people, you know, the, the, the effect of not wanting to say, so, you know, when people ask you who you're going to vote for, you get people who don't want to give it away. And then the numbers surprise people on on the day of the election. It's maybe similar with this. I mean, maybe more people than 15 do know someone, but they just didn't want to say it. Uh, but still, that's, you know, 15% of people surveyed knowing someone who's killed an owl uh, is still, you know, an incredibly high number. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in David uh, Johnson's survey, um, he did a survey in China, and most people believed that owls were actually very helpful and brought good luck. But when they asked the question, um, do, did this person uh, either kill an owl themselves or know someone who did, 120 out of 200 people said yes, that <laughs> they either killed an owl themselves or they knew someone who did. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it is puzzling, but but prevalent. Um, I also thought one of the, the interesting um, kind of litmus test of, of a culture's um, attitudes toward owls is, is their, whether they have owl uh, shaped or owl centric merchandise. Um, and, you know, in, in it, the US and, you know, Brazil, they're just full of owly things, all kinds of, of objects and, you know, candles and, and um, uh, uh, t-shirts and backpacks and everything. And in places like Honduras and Belize, there's almost nothing sold in markets that's owl related. And, um, that, you know, that's a reflection of the, the attitude of the, the culture toward, toward owls. Yeah, I mean, Diego, you, you all know this more than me, you know, um, growing up in, you grew up in rural Colombia, you know, how did you see that kind of attitude, that, that, that fear towards owls reflected in your childhood? You know, it's funny because I was going to say, I don't know anyone that has skill an owl, you know, and, mm -hmm. and even in my childhood in a more rural Colombia, and nowadays traveling all over, you know, Colombia and several countries in, in the region, I, I, I mean, the very only owl I know, you know, someone killed, it was a, it was a unfortunate Stygian owl that broke its wing, you know, mm -hmm. against a wire. And we were with a tour and one of the clients, he was a vet and says, man, you know, I know how to do this job. And 
just just gave a little hand to this animal. But otherwise, I've never encountered that that attitude. And I have to say, if you if you read at least in Colombian, you know, uh, towns and aunties and family, if you read their collections of ob objects, decoration at homes, you find owls a lot to be one of the you know common mm -hmm. things like either elephants or owls in Colombia, elephants, you know, but you know, owls, <laughs> little faces of owls and little figurines are, are very common. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating how owls are in the both, in the two extremes, you know, of, mm -hmm. of hate and love and superstition. But again, you know, how, how the superstition about uh, yellow crown or black crown eye herons or striped cuckoos came to be just pure, pure luck. And you, you, you explain in the book, you know, there is more chances that once your auntie is dying two in the morning and you're there, mm -hmm. there's going to be an owl, you know, doing a little bit of noise than, than a hummingbird or an ant pita. So I think it's just, it's a beautiful coincidence. It's just strange, but it's a beautiful coincidence. Yeah. 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 And it's not hard to understand, you know, why, why or how a, 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 a barn owl, you know, it's kind of ghostly white bird and you only see it out of a corner of your eye and it has these weird hoots and cries, um, you know, when it's usually hanging around vacant buildings, you know, it's not surprising. It might give rise to the notion of a kind of, you know, incarnation, bird incarnation of a of a demon or a spirit being or something. It, it uh, I think yeah. that's the you, uncanny you, you, you nature. Like this, you know. <laughs> well, you just got, yeah, well, unca uncanny well, is the word you just used. And that's <laughs> what I... I noted down while I was while I was reading your book was uncanny was kind of the perfect word to describe our relationship with owls. There is something otherworldly, uncanny, unknowable about owls that kind of contrasts with that slightly erroneous kind of teddy bear cuddly image that we also project onto them. Where it's this kind of weird, almost kind of chop. We'd say you know, in economy like a chocolate, like a meeting point, like a kind of you know, the two things don't really go that well together. It's on one hand these cute, sweet, cuddly birds, and on the other hand these birds that we we don't understand, we don't really know, and we slightly maybe fear, we find them slightly uncanny. What Diego was talking about, even as someone who has studied birds, seen birds all over the world, there's still a sort of slightly unnerving quality to the ability mm -hmm. of the owl you were talking about, Diego, the, um, the buff-fronted owl, to, to pass mm -hmm. all around you, and at no point realize that it's even moving, that it's even flying. I mean, the, the one that I think of, the encounter that you and I shared together, actually, Diego, with owls, that always stands out in my memory is the... Um, the unspotted sawwet owl in Costa Rica, oh. which we were fortunate enough to visit with uh, two people who were basically probably the world's almost two of the world's foremost experts on that species, uh, uh, Ernesto and um, Paz Girola. And Paz Paz. Girola, yeah, in, uh, in in Costa Rica, who have studied these owls, you know, extensively and you know, you know, their their ecology, their breeding, their mating, their calls, all these things. And we were fortunate enough to go and find uh, uh, an individual of that species with them. And we we were out for four or five hours in very bad conditions, wind and rain and trekking up and down canyons. And they knew exactly where the kind of territories of these owls were. So they were hoping to try and band one. They didn't they, they, they didn't succeed the night we were there, but an incredible little bird. Um, yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, that was one of my favorite. And Diego, I noticed that when I mentioned that I'd seen the Northern Sawwet Owl in Michigan, I noticed that you did a... And yeah, what, yeah, what you know, I'm very jealous. I'm very <laughs> jealous because you, you guys were just recently together at the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival, you guys, you know. Mm. And and I've been there and, and we look, you know, when we we're a little northern in Michigan. Once you move a little north, there is all this crazy world of owls that you know opens up. So mm. so recently I was also in Alaska and it was a little a little too early for those, you know, crazy uh great grays and hawk owls and stuff like that. But I was wondering uh, uh in terms of you know the more obscene bird watcher that I know you're not a hardcore bird watcher, but the more obscene bird watcher gene that is on you, what is the rarest? Or what is the, the the hardest owl you've ever had the privilege to 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 go and see oh, and find? No question, um, the blackestin's fish owl. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I did not know how, what I was seeing at the time I mean it was years ago and I was doing a story for National Geographic on um wow. the the uh, winter wildlife of Hokkaido um Japan and we were looking at red crowned cranes and snow monkeys and then the blackest and fish owl and um 
I went out with Sumio Yamamoto, who had been studying them for years and years um, because they're so rare. And they're so, as I said, the, the Ainu people of Japan revere these birds. And um, so they're very, very keen on keeping them around. And it's not easy. But I saw these birds twice, once in a woods um, and I actually got the world's worst photograph of this bird. <laughs> and then um, I got to see it in, in the in the dark in the night. They they were um, they were feeding them on a feeding table. They put putting out raw fish, and um, and there was a, a pair uh, that called to each other, uh, and then came down and 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 took fish. And I you know if I could see now what I saw then. Oh, wow. I just had no idea at the time. But um, yeah, that was by far the, <laughs> the, you know, out there, the most out there owl experience. It was really, I think that's, that's got to be one of my world's most wanted birds, not just owls. I mean, we were, the, the photo I just held up to the camera is from, um, from Owls of the Eastern Ice by, by, Jonathan, by Jonathan Slatt, which is another Fabulous. sort of highly recommended book about mm -hmm. owls. But um, that bird is just something else i mean i think he describes it because i mean you look at the photo and it's again it sums up perfectly that kind of thing we were talking about that dichotomy between being kind of a really big savage you know bird at the same time huge claws six foot wingspan but also looking like you know something from fraggle rock you know it looks like a muppet you know? <laughs> he's totally tousled and silly yeah. and jonathan slatt who wrote that brilliant brilliant book describes him the these birds as kind of walking along the ground like hunched over like an old man you know mm -hmm. it just it just is funny sometimes these birds are so funny they are such they're unusual looking for an owl as well i mean yeah. he, he highlights that in the book and i think you mentioned it as well in yours is that even as owls go they are they are unusual looking and it's partly because they don't have because of it's hypothesized because of their method of, of feeding mostly mm -hmm. fish in loud rivers they don't have the characteristic facial disc right. that we associate with a lot of owl species, which is mm -hmm. kind of key to the hearing. And maybe well, it's how he hypothesizes in the book, and you, you you talk about it in yours as well, that it's perhaps to do with the fact that it's all this rushing water, that it's not going to affect whether they're able to hunt or not, whether they can hear mm -hmm. fish. Mm -hmm. And whether the fish can hear them too, is the, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, uh, Diego, before we, because again, it's become a cliche on the Birdish Show now to say we could probably talk about this for hours, but we definitely could because it's super interesting. But um, before we well, sort we of finish, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we probably shouldn't. Yeah, but before we finish up, um, I, I, I wanted to ask you quickly, Diego, as well, because the same question that you just asked Jennifer, uh, not counting the herd uh, and buff, buff fronted, what's what's the rarest yeah, yeah, yeah. thing? Well, I I have to go a little a little cheesy because it's not the rarest but it was one of the rarest that we had the super super luck to find new for colombia uh it was only a few reports of it and it was one of these napple screech owls in la isla escondida it was only like one or two records and you know one of the things with the screech owls of the genus megascopes is that the taxonomy is not fully resolved mm -hmm. so no one did really knew if this was, you know, Roraiman screech owl or Napo screech owl, species, subspecies. And when we found it at La Isla Escondida, we made recordings. That's south in the country, the border with the Ecuador in Putumayo. We made recordings and we made videos and we made photos. And, you know, it might not be the rarest owl in the Americas, but it was then like a confirm with, you know, evidence, new, newish report for the country. So that was probably, that was probably it. What was, what was for you, man? I don't know. It's funny because... I mean, in terms of the rarest, it probably is the unspotted saw wet, uh -huh. mm -hmm. which I've already talked about. But it's funny. I think my my most, I have kind of two particularly treasured owl encounters, at least. And one is, um, it's a general experience rather than one specific bird. But there's a place up on the, the Wirral Estuary between Liverpool and, and, and Birkenhead in, in, in the UK, where uh, large numbers of short-eared owls overwinter in this kind of brackish water estuary. Uh, and there's also a lot of barn owls that, uh, that, that hunt around there anyway. And if you go... November, December, when we have, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the winter population swollen by the migrating shorted owls, you can go there and stand at sort of dusk and have five, six individuals of shorted owls just hunting around you without a care in the world, just sort of moving around you. And you have that experience of having them fly so close and not hearing a sound, that kind of really rare daytime owl experience, or at least daylight 
adult experience mm-hmm. where you, you don't get that with many species, right? The opportunity to really see them clearly in the day. And then the other one would be quite recently, actually, in, in northern Colombia near Vidal Park. Diego knows about this. Like, the part of my work, we're working with this, this, this company who are turning, it sounds strange, but who are turning this abandoned rum distillery into an interactive graffiti museum. It sounds really weird, I know, but it's a super cool project. And uh, I went up there to, to do some work on this project. And I'd seen a barn owl roosting in, in the eaves of, of one of these old abandoned buildings. And uh, I was walking through just kind of look at all the street art, the incredible graffiti on these abandoned tanks and stills and distilleries. And I heard a hissing noise inside one of the open sort of distillery tanks. I didn't really think much about it. I thought, I wonder what that is. I looked in to find four, three or four baby barn owls wow. staring, staring back at me doing this kind of head rotation thing yeah. that they do from time to time. Everyone do the barn owl. <laughs> and um and I, I i you know i didn't want to disturb them too much so i took you know i took a very quick phone video and then sort of left them to it but it was an incredible and unexpected experience to see because they're such strange of birds because the heart shape yeah. face is really evident in the babies because they've kind of got no other feathers and they have this they're such I, there's a description you described them in the book this kind of strange and they, they also develop in different stages so some of them are a little bit floppier than others and some of them are just these kind of little, little kind of you know heart face heart-shaped face it's kind of fluff balls that's it's funny amazing. it's funny mate because you know quickly you brought me back deja vu to probably 2000 2001 when i was starting biology and i knew i saw all my life as a kid doing my my you know high school and my primary school when i was a kid i saw burnouts flying into this water tank in my neighborhood in urawa you know in the border with panama so when i started biology a friend introduced us to the crazy world of pellets you know, the gagropilas that owls regurgitate and all the information mm. on mammals and birds are there. So one of my crazy encounters probably is climbing up to this tank when I was in my first biology semester and getting into it. And being only two meters away from like, I don't know, five babies, an adult <laughs> bird, they were like, Shh. And I was like, with a, with a big sack, just grabbing kilos and kilos of pellets. <laughs> and, you know, like running like a thief. That's, that, that, that was an encounter actually. That was a cool one. Um, I would the thing, you know, it was pretty yeah. cool. That's great. <laughs> and were the yeah. babies hissing when you, um, did they do that, that, that like... Some, some of them were doing yeah. it, probably, as Chris said, some yeah. look like older than the other ones, probably yeah. a week apart or something. Yeah. Some of them were hissing and doing the crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so okay. funny, they're such, okay. such strange, but I mean, yeah, it's... um. It's it's a cliche because we've talked about it before, but it's a cliche to call owls kind of strange birds. But as you say on the on the, on the, co- uh, the cover of the book, the world's most enigmatic birds. They really mm-hmm. are. Um, uh, some I think two hundred and sixty odd species of of owl currently sort of accepted. You say at the beginning of the book, and uh, and so much to learn about so many of them. There's so many of those species that we know so little about. As Diego said, and some of them like the the megascops family, even the taxonomy of those birds isn't really fully resolved. Right. right. I mean. Uh, I know Diego that you 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 found I think you were part of the trip that found the first was it Cisandian or Transandian uh, uh, Transandian record of foothill screech owl for the Perihau Mountains. Yeah, like, yeah, like a, like a new new I think new subspecies report for the country at the Perihau Parakeet place that you know we both been there and we have mm-hmm. a nice chip of it, of it on the bird show. Yeah, it's it's a lot it's a lot to know about them. It's, you know monotypic species in Peru, only one species in the genus Senoglaus. The long whisker outlet mm-hmm. i mean lots lots of you know mystery still to be uncovered yes. actually i i know chris probably is going to end this thing soon so i have a last little spoiler question is we we're recently you know on a birding trip in southeastern venezuela with friends and we were talking about you know how much we loved your two previous books mm-hmm. and you know how they were general about all birds but this new book was about the family so we were wondering like i mean you already told us a little bit why a family but what's what's coming next are, are we going to see you know like parrotish stories from around the world or or <laughs> you know i mean it has to be something worldwide distribution like it, it, no don't tell us what's the new book of course but are, are you no. choosing something already it's going to be a, a another family it's going to yeah, be a really no 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 i'm i'm going to be owly about this and i'm not going to give it away but um it is another bird book and it is global and it's global? yeah it's um it's a it's a big look okay. <laughs> it's not focusing in um 
yeah so i'm not going to say more than that as i yeah, said no, i'm going to be alley about it so. we won't push it anymore but, but anybody watching you know if you've got any guesses put it in the comments i'd yeah, love to come back i'd love to come back to the comment section in you know yeah. x number of years time when the new book comes out and see if anybody actually guessed it that would be please, please. Um, put in the comments put, put also in the comments your experiences with ours guys like we want to read well what I was going to say is uh, because uh, Jennifer and her publishers have very kindly agreed to give away a copy of What an Owl Knows uh, to one lucky viewer. And uh, because, you know, we're fair enough. This has been live on Facebook, but it's also going to be on our YouTube channel. And it's a bit of a last minute thing, this, that we organized with Jennifer. So we, don't, we want to be fair because not that many people have had the opportunity to join us live right now on Facebook, but hopefully many more will be able to join us on YouTube. Hello to YouTube. Um, what I want to do is uh, do exactly what Diego just said. Put in the comments your personal owl memory, your best. It doesn't even have to be with a living owl. Maybe a cherished family member had an owl embroidered pillow that you loved as a child. Anything like that. It doesn't even have to be some owl you've seen. Your cherished owl memory, your best experience with an owl of any sort. Uh, and we will put them all together. And Jennifer, if you will be so kind, in a few weeks' time, we'll send you the grab bag, the whole the whole bag, like Diego with his bag of owl pellets. We'll send you the whole mailbox of all of those comments, and maybe you can help us choose the best one, and we can send out to one lucky winner uh, a brand new copy of What an Owl Knows, which comes out uh, July thirteenth. Um, I'll do the the promo stuff now. Do go and get hold of a copy, but maybe maybe wait and see if you've won first if you're a birdish review, because you might you might or, or buy one and then when you win it, give it to a friend or a family member and help spread the owl love uh, because it really is a great book um we love the genius of birds and the bird where we've we've seen you can see in the description the link to go and see our previous interview jennifer uh it really is a fantastic book congratulations because it's a brilliant read i've been lucky enough to have my hands on this copy for three or four days and i burned through it over the weekend uh and we'll be going back and giving it a second a second read because like i said every page has some fantastic little nugget of information some great little story i do love the way that you bring human stories into uh into the story of the birds which you've done in your previous books as well it's uh, i find myself enjoying reading the stories of these incredible people as you talked about almost as much as i enjoy learning about the birds which is which is a i think a great achievement um diego um i have to say i'm quite jealous of your background i've been hearing birds singing you're just sitting there in the countryside while i deal with bogota traffic noise but uh came back home I'm... man came back home uh, <laughs> yeah colombia Tatalak has been here and great rest of wood rands and it's been a pleasure it's been a pleasure you know doing a little studio-ish thing again with jennifer that is one of our lovely you know guests old friends from the birder show and you know i'm i'm really pleased to see that the book is going out soon and that we are going to have a lucky winner from our audience. Absolutely. Well, we are going to now stop going live on Facebook. So thank you to everyone who's uh, joined us on Facebook Live on this conversation with Jennifer talking about what an owl knows. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, see you soon. Jennifer, gracias. Thank you both so much. Thank you all.